Good afternoon or evening. This lesson is being recorded for Sunday, October the 4th, 2020. This is our second lesson being recorded for the day, as we are at this time still only meeting one time until we get a good grasp of how to deal with COVID-19. Hopefully in the very near future, solutions will make it safer for us to assemble together regularly as we are used to. Nevertheless, in the meantime, we will continue with our online studies. And that's what we are going to do this evening for this second lesson. I want to ask you to turn your Bibles this evening to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And what I am going to do in this lesson is I am going to uh, begin a series of lessons, something that I typically do uh, about one Sunday a month where we just go through a book of the New Testament. And uh, not too long ago, we finished up the book of Philippians, and uh, it's been a couple of months, but, but I decided I would go ahead and, and resume with another book because I'm not sure how long it will be before we actually have the ability to assemble together on Sunday evenings uh, at the building. And so I'm just going to go ahead and start this particular study. This will be an ongoing monthly study. That is, the plan is, as a rule, to to present one lesson a month, systematically going through the entire book of 1 Peter, and I'm going to follow that up with 2 Peter. Now, there may be some times where I change Sundays. There may be some time where I decide to do two or three lessons following one another because of the, the flow of the context and so on. But we just want to go through this entire text from uh, verse by verse and, and take our time and learn from it what God would have us to do. This letter is described as one of the general epistles. And basically all that simply means is it, it's, a, it's a description that we've given to the letters that were written by the apostles other than Paul. The letters that were written by Peter, James, John, uh, Jude, and those are all described as the general epistles. And, and so it's just a name that we've given to them. And they have very practical lessons in them, so it very much applies. The lessons we find in First Peter are very, very timely. And, and, and to be honest, they're for quite a while I've been looking forward to beginning this particular study because of some of the things that are taught in this book. And we're actually going to see that as we go through our lesson here um, uh, this evening. Now tonight what we're going to do is we're going to introduce this letter. I want to give you a little bit of a background because I believe that the background to a letter sometimes gives you a little better understanding of what is actually being said in the context and it helps you to relate to some of the observations that are made. And, and then time permitting, we'll just get into verses one and two, and we'll talk a little bit about those two verses. And if I don't get to that, I'll deal with that uh, in our next lesson. Uh, and right now, my plans are the first Sunday night of each month to go through this particular book. So let's go ahead and get started with 1 Peter by looking at background. And I do want to go ahead and read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, because it actually gives us some of the background that we want to be looking into. So we read there, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. And thus we have Peter's introduction. And the first observation I would like to address is who wrote the book? And we have the answer right there that this book was written by Peter and he describes himself as an apostle of Jesus. So that eliminates uh, any other Peter that you might come across, uh, even though I don't think there's many of them in scriptures. We have plenty of Simons, but nobody by the name of Peter other than this particular Peter that I know of. Now, uh, uh, 
as to whether or not Peter actually wrote this first letter, it's, it's pretty much universally accepted. And, and if you do research on background, you'll find that there are various books that are discussed for one reason or another. This one is almost universally accepted both internally and externally. And what I mean by internally is, is looking at the content of the letter. It fits the description of Peter. First of all, it begins with, as we just mentioned, uh, he's mentioned by name in chapter 1 and in verse number 1, so obviously that points to him. Also, one other verse that, that comes to my mind in this particular letter in chapter 5, and in verse 1 where he says, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, so those two expressions there describe some things that are associated with Peter as we have find recorded in, uh, in the Gospels. One of the things that comes to my mind is that Peter was married as recorded in Matthew 8 verses 14 through 17 where we are told there that, he, that Jesus healed his mother-in-law. So of necessity, of necessity he had to have been married. And the interesting observation to be made there is he describes himself as an elder. And if you go over to Matthew 3 and you read the qualifications of an elder, one of those qualifications is he has to be a married man. He has to have faithful, believing children. So we know Peter was married based upon this text. So that's just one of the things that points toward this belonging to or, or being a letter that was written by Peter, and I'm certainly going to treat it that way. And when I mention externally, what that means is many of the early writers who wrote about the Word of God, we sometimes describe them as the, the church fathers, the patristic writers, or, or other descriptions like that. When they make reference to this book, they uh, attribute it to Peter. And so there's uh, ample evidence that the majority of people will readily accept that this is a letter that was written by Peter. Now, how well do we know Peter? He's more than likely one of the, one of the better known of the original apostle, apostles of Jesus. And I would venture to say uh, possibly the best known of all of them. We know that he was the one who was outspoken. He was the one who would, uh, would stand out front and be the first one to speak up in many instances. Uh, he is the one who in Matthew 16 and verses 18 and 19 where uh, Jesus describes based upon a statement he would build his church. In verse 16, Peter is the one who says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He is the one who tells Jesus over in, in, the, in the gospel of John when, when disciples are leaving him, uh, where are we going to go? He says, uh, who are we going to go to? Uh, we have come to believe that you are God. Uh, you have the words of life. We're going to follow you. And of course, we know, we know, we know Peter from uh, as Jesus was about to be betrayed, and he tells all of his apostles, you are all going to betray me. And Peter says, not me. And of course, Jesus said, yes, you will. Three times, you will deny me this evening before the rooster crows, and as Mark records it, before the rooster crows twice. And of course, Jesus was correct, and Peter denies the Lord three times goes out and weeps bitterly. But you also read about Peter in John chapter 21 and what I believe is the restoration of Peter because of his denials. And this is where Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? And the way that Peter answers demonstrates some, some hesitation because he's not sure uh, 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 he's not sure of himself. At least that's the way that I understand that particular reading. He's He's been deflated. He's not as confident and arrogant as he was. And then, of course, in the book of Acts, Peter's the sermon that we have recorded in Acts 2 as he stands up with the others and he preaches that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. We find that Peter is the one who was sent to Cornelius in, in Acts chapter 10, the first full Gentile convert. And in Acts 15, where, where uh, he's defending his actions and, and uh, d defending uh, Gentiles as becoming children of God with, without having to submit to the law of Moses, uh, he uses that as an example, and he actually makes a very 
powerful argument there in Acts chapter 15, verses 7 through 11, dealing with that. So that's some of the things that we know about Peter as recorded in uh, in the Gospels. And I could go on with so many other uh, things that are mentioned about the life of Peter, but I just wanted to remind us a little bit of that because as we go through this letter, it gives us a little bit of an understanding of the things that he's writing about and to what degree he understands what people are going through. Excuse me here a moment. Peter is an apostle that I believe that we can relate to. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you look at Paul, once he's converted, he seems to be like this super apostle. Uh, and, and, and we struggle to relate to Paul because of, uh, because of that. And the same thing might be said about John. There's not a whole lot of negative things that are said about John. But we get to Peter we find that Peter makes mistakes. We find in Galatians chapter 2 that, 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 that Peter was uh, rebuked by Paul because he was a hypocrite. He played the hypocrite in, 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 in uh, his association with Jews and Gentiles, and, and Paul challenges him on that. And so we can relate to Peter because we know that we all have flaws the way that Peter did. And Keep that in mind as you read through these letters and you look at these practical letters and how Peter is encouraging us to live the way that we ought to. Now this letter is written to, as you go back to our text, it is written to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So Peter describes this as a letter that is written to disciples in these various regions. And if you were to pull out a map, of that particular area, and this is a map that I borrowed from my Logos software. Uh, we find here, I have circled uh, the region that is sometimes described as Asia or, or, or Asia Minor, and you will find that these five provinces are all described here. So Peter is writing to this particular area here. And what I always like to point out when I look at a biblical map is you will look at the bottom here is Jerusalem. And that and we always use Jerusalem as our focal point. Of course, on the other end of the map, you have Rome, which of course is in Italy. And that means that this big body of water that we have here is what would be the Mediterranean Sea today. And uh, up above, I believe, is the Black Sea. And you've got the Aegean Sea in this area. And so this is the region to which Peter is writing this particular letter. And we have uh, Christians who he describes as pilgrims here. And I'll talk more about that word uh, a little bit later when we get uh, a little more into the text. But what we find about this group that is not specifically mentioned in uh, the, the letter, you know, likely this is what I would describe as a mixed congregation of both Gentiles and Jews. And I have them in that order for a reason, because I more than likely these were pr uh, primarily Gentiles in these congregations. But, but as I said, you probably have a mix of both of them. And Peter is writing to them uh, as such to encourage them to be faithful. Now, exactly how these churches in these various regions began, and understand that because this letter was written to these regions, and, and more than likely, these regions had multiple churches each. So, so, so this letter was a letter that was intended to be circulated, which was true of all of the letters of the New Testament as they were written, and which is why fairly early on, after, after a letter was, was actually composed by the actual author, it would not be long before copies of that letter began to be made, and either the original or the copies would be distributed to the audience that they were intended for and even beyond those audiences. And that's what's taking place here. So you have all these different churches, and, and this letter is going to be distributed among these different congregations and sent to brethren in various 
places. Now, exactly how these churches began, we do not know. We're, we're not giving given specifics of it. I will say this in Acts chapter 2, where you find the nations recorded that were assembled in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Some of those regions are actually mentioned in that chapter. We also find in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, and this is after a while in Jerusalem, where you may remember those who were converts, they remained in Jerusalem for a good good length of time until persecutions caused them to be scattered, and they took the word with them everywhere. And I suspect that many of those, as they were scattered, they went preaching the word. More than likely, they went back to the place from which they came which means some of them might have taken the gospel with them to these particular regions. Uh, I do know that Paul had communication with the Galatians. We have a letter that is written to the churches of Galatia, and the way that Paul corresponds with them, it seems that he had some type of a personal relationship with at least some of them. Whatever the case, it's possible that at some time, Paul could have gone there and been an encouragement to these particular brethren and started some congregations or strengthened other congregations that were already in existence. The bottom line is we're not told exactly how these churches begin, but we know that they are there. And the thing to learn about these churches is that there you have faithful saints that are standing fast for the truth wherever they are at. And that's even in troubling circumstances as we look at the purpose behind this letter uh, of First Peter. Now, one of the observations that I would make about this before we begin, and this I just think is good to understand this, is, is exactly when was this letter written. And while, while we're not given a specific late in the, uh, for the, uh, date for this letter, most people believe it was written in the mid-60s. Um, they range from 62 to 68 AD in the various descriptions. We, we know that Second Peter is, is Peter's farewell letter. Uh, he describes how, uh, how he realizes he's not going to be here that much longer, much like Paul does to Timothy in Second Peter. Timothy. And more than likely, 1 Peter was written not too long before that particular letter. And so those are some reasons that are given for this a little bit of a later date. And if this is the case, this is uh, it is believed that Peter was executed somewhere around uh, 68 or, or 69 AD. And again, we don't know those things because we're not specifically told them, but there's evidence that uh, causes people to reach those particular conclusions. Another interesting fact about this letter is it was uh, it could have been written from Babylon over in uh, 1 Peter 5 as Peter is bringing this letter to a conclusion in verse number uh, uh, 13 of chapter 5. We read there, She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark. And so uh, many see that particular expression there, and uh, they, they see that this letter is associated with being written from Babylon. But of course that leads to the question, what is Babylon or where is Babylon? Well, if you were to look on a map, Babylon would actually be well east of that region that we were talking about. Um, uh, but some also think that Babylon is a reference to Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire, and they use that as a description. Some based upon the book of Revelation, where there, there are those who believe that uh, the latter part of Revelation, when they make reference to Babylon, it's a description of, of Rome as the leader of that particular uh, empire, just as the city of Babylon was the leader of the Babylonian Empire, And you find that all in Revelation 17 and 18 and so on, all these descriptions of Babylon, the great, that is going to fall. But I also see that this could be dealing with a figurative description of uh, considering what Babylon meant to the children of Israel and to others. The, the fact that, uh, the fact that, uh, Babylon is where Judah was carried away into captivity for 70 years. 
uh, as recorded in Second Chronicles, the latter part of Second Chronicles, the latter part of uh, Second Kings, they return from Babylon as as recorded in the book of Daniel uh, and uh, uh, and other places. So so we find that Babylon was used to describe captivity. Those who had been in persecution and, and treated with hostility. And you'll find here that that is a theme that is associated with this particular letter. So, so exactly where Babylon is, I, I struggle with the idea of Peter actually having gone to Rome and this being a reference to Rome. And I would lean toward it either being he actually was in Babylon for some reason or, or this figurative description of, uh, of Christians who are suffering. And he wants to encourage them that, that uh, they're going to be okay. Because that's really the point that he makes in this particular letter. As a matter of fact, if I were to discuss what the purpose of the letter is, the first thing I would describe about it is it's talking about suffering. And I think that's the main point that Peter is making in this letter. He's encouraging these brethren that you are going to suffer as a child of God, but don't give up in your suffering. And as a matter of fact, you will find that suffering is a is a rather significant theme in this book. The book of 1 Peter is a relatively short lesson, a letter. It's, it's, it's only five chapters long, and uh, you, know, it, it, you can sit down and probably read the entire letter in 15 to 30 minutes, depending on how fast or how slow you read. And uh, I, I kind of actually recommend that you do that a, a few times as we go through this. Maybe the first Sunday of each month uh, before, uh, before services, read the entire letter to help prepare you, put in context the section that we're dealing with. Uh, but we find suffering all throughout this letter. As a matter of fact, the Greek word for suffering, pasco, is actually found 12 times in this relatively short letter. The first time is found over in 1 Peter 2, verses 19 and 20, where, where Peter is dealing with servants, and he challenges servants to submit, uh, uh, where he he's, uh, challenges them to submit to their masters and such. And then he gives them encouragement there, where in verses 19 and 20 of that text, he talks about uh, this is commendable if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Be willing to suffer wrongfully if for, for the cause of Christ. And, and, and that's built into a lot of these passages that are talking about the idea of suffering. Over in uh, chapter 2, verses 21 through 24, at least three times... Peter makes reference to the suffering of Jesus. This one, the most extensive and, and I think the most powerful, we actually mentioned it in our lesson this morning, uh, where Peter says, to this you are called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. And uh, uh, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return when he suffered. He did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. And the point that Peter makes there about Jesus is that he's an example of how to suffer. And, and note how when he was mistreated, when he was reviled, uh, he didn't revile back. Or when he was suffering, he didn't threaten as a result of that. That's a lesson for us to learn. Uh, over in chapter 3 and in verse number 14, the challenge is there. Um, if you suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. That's dealt with even more in verses 17 and 18. Uh, it is better if if you suffer uh, if you suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And again in verse uh, 18 he gives the example of Christ. The fact that he suffered for us. Chapter 4 and in verse number 1, Christ suffered for us in the flesh. So over and over, <laughs> Peter mentions the sufferings of Jesus. And among the things that he reminds us about in dealing with the suffering in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 4, he makes the point there that if you're reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 
On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is uh, glorified. And he and he's talking about there how you rejoice to the extent that you partake of the sufferings of Christ as recorded there in verse number 13. So 13 through 15, he's dealing with the idea of, a, of us suffering and how you rejoice in that. And he also points out that you should not be suffering with bad behavior. Um, uh, verse 15, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer, or as a busy, busybody in other people's matter. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. And then over in chapter 5 and in verse 10, uh, here you have even promises that are associated with that. May the God of all grace who called us to eternal glory by Jesus Christ after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So there you have encouragement and promises that will come if you will just simply endure your suffering. There's other themes that we also find in this book that are worthy of thinking about. One of those themes has to do with the subject of submission. Another word that is found several times, and it's associated with uh, of the suffering and being willing to submit even when even when you're being mis uh, when you are being mistreated and suffering over in first Peter 2 and verse 13 this is where Peter reminds us just like Romans chapter 13 does that we are to submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether to the king or governors or other individuals in chapter 2 and verse 18 that we read a few moments ago, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. And he says, not just the good ones, even, even, the, even the evil evil ones, because it's commendable if you endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, Peter deals with wives being submissive to their husbands and explains some things about that. In chapter 5 and in verse number 5, we read there that you are to... Uh, younger people are to submit to the elders, and yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. We are to submit to one another. That means we think about each other and think about their interests. The younger are encouraged to submit to those who are elderly, to respect the elderly, which is, I believe, the point of this particular verse. There are things that are said about elders prior to this, uh, that is, elders who lead within a Lord's congregation. You also find in chapter 3 and in verse number 22, dealing with Jesus. And the point that is made here, he talks about how Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. They've subjected themselves and they submit to him. And, and we learn a little bit about submitting to authority how the angels are in subjection to Jesus. So there's a whole deal or a whole lot to be said about the subject of submission in this particular letter. And again, we're going to tackle all those things as we get to it. In addition to that, we also find a, a living hope. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, as Peter begins this letter, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. And he goes on from there. He talks about this living hope that we have. It's that source of encouragement that we need. And in our next lesson, we're going to deal with that. Well, he goes on after that, and he talks about holy living, which, uh, 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 which is also addressed throughout this. The idea of holiness is to be set apart. The word sanctify, uh, the word saint, are all associated with the same Greek word, are all based on the same root word in the Greek language that means to be consecrated or, or set apart for a special purpose. And we read several things about 
holy living, which is why we have a living hope. Things about being set apart. Over in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 1, you read there in that text, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Be holy is the challenge. Looking to the holiness of God as your example. In chapter 2 verses 5 through 10, we, we find here a, a powerful admonition to be priests. To realize that we are a spiritual house, a holy priesthood being built up to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. And if you engage in a study of the, uh, of the Levitical priesthood in the book of Exodus and Leviticus, you learn about the holiness that was associated with the priesthood. And Peter says, we're all priests. We all have spiritual sacrifices uh, to offer a great text that we will eventually get to. In, in chapter 3 and in verse 15, a, a passage that I, I, I very occasionally quote is one that, that says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The idea is that you sanctify God in your heart. That word sanctify, set yourself aside, to belong to God. Be holy and be ready to defend your hope. So those things are tied together. And that's some of the, the themes that we have in this book. But we also have a lot of practical admonitions. You go through this general letter here, over and over you find just practical things that apply to us. And it's all throughout the book. You know, Paul, and in many of Paul's letters, he'll mention some practical things as you're going through. But he, he basically has this doctrinal subject, and incidentally, so does Peter. But Paul gives those practical admonitions typically toward the end of his letters. Peter sprinkles these things all throughout in describing the way that we are to live. In 1 Peter 1 verses 13 and 14, he talks about how you are to gird up the loins of your mind to be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Be obedient children, not conforming yourself to the former lusts. So you're a changed person, and, and you need to prepare your minds so that you can do this. That's what he means by girding up the loin of your minds. In, in verses 22 and 23 of that chapter 1, you've purified your souls in obeying the truth uh, in sincere love of the brethren. Love one another fervently with a pure heart. We need to love each other. If we're dealing with a hostile world, we need each other. Uh, put away hatred, Roman or uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 1. Laying aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking. And then in verse 2, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So put away hatred and hateful attitudes and desire the pure milk of the word so that you can grow by that. In 2 Peter and verse 11, he talks there about how you abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. In verse 12, he talks about how your conduct is to be honorable among the Gentiles, basically so that if they have charges against you, those charges will not stand, and they will be put to shame when your honorable conduct comes out. Chapter 2, verses 13 through 7, in the middle, 17, in the middle of everything, he talks about you obey your governing authorities. He also talks about more in 1 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9, how we are to be of one mind and how we are to care for one another. This talks about the unity that we need to have with each other. Chapter 4 and in verse number 9, Peter there says, Be hospitable to one another another. 
without grumbling. We are to be caring and sharing with one another and be that type of a person. In verses 10 and 11, he talks about how you are to be using the gifts that you have been given. Verse 11 is the verse that says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God, or as if God were uttering it himself. In chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, you humble yourselves uh, because God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Let God do the exalting. You humble yourself. And in chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, he begins to conclude this letter by saying, You, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So you have the warning there to be alert. Satan's seeking to devour you. And so there we have some of the themes that are associated with this particular book. Now that actually brings us to the introduction. And I'm going to go ahead and conclude my lesson at this time. And in our next lesson, we will get into we will get into some of the uh, things that he says in these first verses. And we will actually go beyond that and start getting into verses 3 and following in his opening, uh, his opening blessing to these particular brethren. Uh, but it's my hope that what we've seen, even in this introductory lesson, uh, we, we, we see that this is a practical book. And, and what I want you to understand that we're living in troubling times right now. Uh, there's no question about that. That, that, that the times are challenging and, and there's just difficult things going on around us. And we may be suffering in one way or another. If you're suffering, you might ask the question, where can I go in God's word to receive strength and encouragement? Well, I've just given it to you. Read through the book of First Peter and notice some of the things that Peter says to help you deal with your struggles and whatever way you seem to be suffering and, and the disappointments that you see in this life. God will be with you is the point that is there. So keep in mind in this lesson that we need to endure and we cannot give up. And that's the point that I encourage each and every one of us to consider. So if you would at this time, please bow with me. Our dear God in our heaven, once again we come to you. As always, we thank you for your abundant blessings. We know that you bless us above and beyond what we deserve in so many different ways. We also know that the times that we are living in now are particularly trying and we are dealing with challenges that most of us have not had to deal with up to this point. But we all have difficulties in this life, dear God, and we pray that as we do, that we will maintain a proper attitude, that we will learn to put our trust in you, and that, that we, will, we will be willing to suffer for your cause, um, even if we are rejected by this world. Give us the strength to do the right things. Give us the strength to be everything that you would have us to be. And now, dear God, we pray that as we conclude this lesson and as we, uh, uh, we pray that you will be with us as we go through the rest of this evening and as we go through this week, help us in all that we do to put our trust in you and to let our light shine in the midst of this dark world and to be willing to endure and to never give up. We ask all these things through your son's name and amen. And again, I want to thank each and every one of you for listening to this lesson. Lord willing, you have a good week. And next time, we will meet again together. And until then, uh, God be with you and stay faithful.